Here's Brody Brazil. Well, there's no question this weekend had been circled on the calendars of Sharks fans for quite some time. And now that it's over in reverse, I really do feel like it lived up to expectations. Not just for the franchise getting their first ever number one overall pick in any draft, but also the event itself in Las Vegas at the Sphere. It was pulled off flawlessly. It just had a really nice look and feel to it. But like I said, most of this video is about how the Sharks did and specifically what happened in the first round. I'm going to play you some clips of interviews I did for work. By the way, you can find these full interviews at my company's YouTube channel. That's NBC Sports Bay Area. I will link to all of those videos down below. So without further delay, these are some interviews with people like Mike Greer, Ryan Warsawski, obviously Sam Dickinson, and Macklin Celebrini, as well as Macklin's dad. You're going to hear from everybody here in just tiny little portions. We'll begin with the general manager who was tasked with making all these picks and the maneuvering even before the draft started. You might recall Sharks had number one, 14, 33, and 42. Mike Greer was able to leverage that 14th pick, turn it into an 11th pick, and get Sam Dickinson as part of the process. But knowing he had number one all along and knowing that number one was going to be Macklin Celebrini, it kind of was a low-maintenance pick for Mike Greer. Here's what he said about it. Mike, appreciate the time. We're discussing here what just happened in the first round, and obviously your first pick was a no-brainer in the hockey world. In reverse, did that open up you and your front office to think about other things and, and work on other things because the number one pick was kind of a given? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you get that first pick in your... You kind of have that in your back pocket and you know what it looks like and then you can kind of focus, especially with us having 14, it gave us some right. a little bit of leeway to, you know, explore moving up, which we did, or right. and, um, and maybe, uh, depending how it felt, maybe take a swing at a player at 11 or 14 that maybe had a, a, big, up, a big upside because we knew, you know, we knew what we had in Macklin. I don't know if you'll admit to specifically Sam Dickinson, but was it that type of player that you were hoping to get in the jump from 14 to 11? Yeah, we had a kind of a group of players in mind that we didn't think would be there at 14 yeah. that we thought are impact players. Um, you know, I never thought in, when we moved up that Sam would be there. Yeah. So, um, you know, as that, as, it, as a round kind of <laughs> kept unfolding, uh, you know, we, we were getting super happy and, and uh, you know, you want the clock to <laughs> tick down faster and faster because... Um, you could see it coming. You could see it yeah. coming and... and uh, you know, an opportunity to add a defenseman like that and was um, it's pretty special. Yeah, so Mike Greer obviously getting maybe even more than he thought with that number 11 overall pick. So Greer in attendance as part of the decision makers. It's not necessarily the job of the head coach to be part of the draft process. That's more the front office and the scouting department. But it was the first go-around as a head coach in the NHL for Ryan Warsawski. He's the 11th head coach in Sharks franchise history. He's 36 years old. He'll be the youngest head coach in the NHL starting next season. He was able to observe this process, but I wanted to talk more about his recent hiring and how there's something unique going on in his journey. All the times he's been an assistant, now turned head coach of that very same team. If my math is correct, this will be the third time you've gone from being a team's assistant coach yeah. to their head coach, right? Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. What's what's the secret? What do, you, what do you already know about making this leap? Because I don't know that that happens for yeah. everybody like that. Yeah, so I've got experience doing it and not much is going to change. I'm going to be me and, um, you know, the players that know me are going to see how I operate and how I communicate yeah. and how I run my meetings. Um, I think they know how I want to play. You know, and we'll get into that as, as, a, as the season and the summer goes on. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something I've been through before, and I kind of i am experienced with it and kind of excited about it. And Ryan Warsawski obviously has a lot of things to be excited about. The draft, future players, prospects already in the pipeline. The fact that the Sharks, during this upcoming free agency period, they're actually going to have to spend up to the salary cap floor. They made so many moves and cleared up so much salary cap space They've actually got to go out and, and make a dent in the free agent market. So Ryan Warsawski should have a pretty good team uh, to turn things around with, at least. I'm not saying a team that's going to necessarily compete for the playoffs next year. Uh, that would be nice, but he's going to have a pretty nice team in, in terms of establishing himself as an NHL head coach. By the way, I should mention all of the coverage here that I'm about to show you, it only pertains to night one, Friday night, and the first round. 
I'm not necessarily going to get into all the other picks and things that happen. Maybe some other point down the road, I'll, I'll recap all of that. This is really a first round uh, type video. Sam Dickinson was that number 11 overall pick. And I, I found what was interesting in talking to Macklin, um, although he did say it felt surreal to be in that moment and to finally have the Sharks jersey on, he really didn't want to commit. I mean, he knew what was going to happen, but he wanted to let it happen before he acknowledged it. If you think about Sam Dickinson, he went to bed the night before having no clue what his future would hold, what new city he might call home, what franchise he might be attached to for so many years. And a lot of people saw the draft going on, as Mike Greer just alluded to, and saw Dickinson not being selected and wondered, like, wait, we thought he would go a lot earlier. And I think this is going to be one of the surprise picks for San Jose as we look down the road. I, I, I can't exactly tell you all of the instinctual things I feel, but just looking at Sam Dickinson, kind of getting a, a gauge on personality and body language, charisma, I wanted to use that word, there's something about him that just already tells me he's going to do really well with this San Jose organization. And I hope someday we revisit this video and me saying this about him, and I hope I'm absolutely right. But anyway, for Dickinson, imagine the whirlwind of a weekend it was in Las Vegas. You fly in, you have no clue what your future is going to hold, and he will leave Las Vegas know, knowing that he'll be headed to Sharks Development Camp now. Well, Sam, let's begin with you first. There's no way you slept last night, right? It was tough. <laughs> I, I, I woke up pretty early and went to bed pretty late, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a little tired, but uh, I think you know I've never had more life after after you know the last uh, the last however long it's been. Well, congratulations on the moment. I'm sure all of this is a blur to you. I hope you do remember this someday. What are your thoughts about the San Jose Sharks? I know you said you've never even been to California, but familiar with at least where the Sharks are at. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know being in London, having you know Casper Haldeman there, and yep. you know just kind of hearing him rave about you know the the Sharks and the organization, and, you know the area of San Jose is you know really unbelievable, and you know I couldn't be more excited. And I don't think it's any secret when they moved up a couple days ago to get the 11th pick, a lot of people instantly said, "All right, they're going for a D-man." Well, to kind of put everything together in reverse and think that maybe they wanted you so bad that they made that trade, moved up. Is there anything? That goes through your mind about that? Uh, not really. It's but speculation. I, you know, I get it, but yeah, it's a know, compliment. Now, now that you say it a little bit, you know, yeah. it's nice to kind of kind of think that. But you know, uh, it's really just you know uh, being being put in this position and then you know being a part of this organization is you know unbelievable. And I think it's really important that the Sharks diversify their draft picks, right? If you have a lot of forwards in your pipeline and in your system, and the Sharks do have some blue liners, but to get a high pick defenseman, the number eleventh overall, who could have easily gone top ten. I think that's a big deal so that you're not just getting forward after forward after forward like the Edmonton Oilers did. And I know it's generally worked out for them. Uh, but I think that's kind of why their their turnover process didn't go as fast as possible. It's because they were drafting the same type of player when they had all those number one picks in the 2010s uh, in last decade. So the bottom line is we kind of knew when the Sharks traded up it was most likely to get a defenseman. That's what they got. They probably got one they didn't even think they could get. I think that's going to bode really well for the future of the organization. All right, not Macklin Celebrini yet. We'll get to him in a second. First, we got to talk to his dad, Rick, who, as you probably already know, uh, has worked with the Warriors in recent years as one of their trainers, as, as somebody on their staff who works very closely with world-class, world champion athletes like Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and Clay Thompson, if he's still or, or not on the Warriors by the time you watch this video. But the point is, is, is Rick has done such a good job with that team over time. Uh, Rick already has one of his other sons, Aiden, who was drafted by Vancouver last year. Now Macklin Celebrini going to the San Jose Sharks. And um, you got to just think that the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree here. I'd never met Rick before this. I had heard him speak and, and could understand like the type of person he is and just seems very... Uh, honest and open and and straightforward and, you know, seems like a winner. I, I don't really know how else to say it. Determined, motivated, goal-oriented, and you can see that that obviously has been passed down through his family and his children. And in so many good ways, Rick just seems like a really good guy from everything that I, I take away. So I had the opportunity to talk to Rick about his son Macklin being drafted. I saw Draymond pumping him up in an interview. I know Steph has given him his own nickname or, you know, right, talked right. about that. What's the interaction you've witnessed between your son and some of the players that you work with on the Warriors and maybe what's been gained, what's been learned, and, and what he's been exposed to over there? 
Yeah, I think, you know, especially when we came down as a family, it was in a very influential age for both boys, the older boys. Uh, I think the younger ones were a little bit young, but I think they all benefited from just seeing the environments that uh, Bob Myers and Steve Kerr had created. Um, you know, a welcoming environment, but also, a, you know, an elite uh, uh, environment that was uh, a championship environment. And, and to see the core group at that point in their careers, what the way they approached their craft, the dedication, the commitment, the intensity of their workouts, it's just something that I think every young athlete should experience. I'm gonna make more of a statement here than ask you a question. You know, you look at the way the Warriors were built, the, the core and the foundation through the draft, right? Steph right. and Clay and Draymond. Right. It's kind of special that the Sharks are doing that exact same thing right now for their next generation. Has that ever struck you? It, it has, it has, and you know, Obviously, when we knew San Jose was a possibility, yeah. I, I did a little bit of research and looked at their pipeline of young players. Yeah. And they're stockpiling a really exciting yeah. group uh, with Will Smith last year and, and now Macklin, you know, fortunate enough to, to, to join that group. It really feels like they're getting some momentum, some excitement. I mean, that, that building was one of the hardest places to play. Yep. You guys all experienced oh, it yeah. um, in, in their heyday. And, and I've talked to a lot of people around the league that, that uh, can't speak highly enough of the environment that was created there. And hopefully they can work towards building that again. And it really feels like that's the case. The Celebrinis, by the way, maintain their home as a ranch out in Livermore. So I asked Rick and Macklin separately, hey, you know, if you're going to come out here and play for the Sharks next year and live out here, maybe you just live with your parents in Livermore and do the commute. Both of them instantly laughed it right off and said, no chance. And I think they knew that I was kidding. And, you know, the other big thing surrounding Macklin right now is that obvious question are you going to stay in college one more year or will you come out to San Jose? And if you do, does it mean you go straight to the NHL? I'm not sure anybody has ever discussed him playing a season in the American Hockey League, but will you sign a contract with San Jose now or will you do what Will Smith did and wait one more year before turning pro? And Macklin is not ready to answer that question yet. He gets asked that question At every single opportunity. And if you watch my full interview with him, I bring it up loosely just to point out that I brought it up and checked that box because I know he's not going to answer it. So uh, I respect others who are waiting on that. But I think Macklin and the team are going to let us know when, in fact, he'll have made that decision, decision and that process will have happened. So I thought in approaching an interview with Macklin, I would keep it a little bit more light. Uh, to understand where he's at, what this experience is like, what it means to him, how comfortable he even feels coming to San Jose. He said he had no clue that Joe Thornton was going to be the person to announce the Sharks' pick. I think he'll say that here in the interview. But I I wanted to keep it just a little bit more personable than anything else. So here's how I threw it in here. I feel like I, I should also take this moment to talk about the flow. You have, yeah. you've got, a, you've got a great head of hockey hair, my friend. <laughs> I appreciate is that. that. Is I that appreciate gonna, that. Is that going to be a staple of yours, or is that who you are? Is that your thing? Um, you going to keep it? I'm not, I, I think I'm going to keep it. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe I'll change at some point. Yeah. Obviously, San Jose has been looking for a lot of turning points in the last couple of years, and a lot of people see you as part of that. Not to put all the pressure on you, but how do you feel about joining a franchise that's got a lot of momentum right now in a lot of different ways? Oh, I'm, I mean, I couldn't be more excited. Um, they're building an amazing foundation for, for a lot of success in the future, and um, I'm just fortunate enough to be a part of it. And I can't wait to see uh, where this group ends up. And you had no clue that Joe Thornton was here to introduce the first pick? And I, I, make saw, first him, pick? I yeah. saw him before the draft, but I, I had no idea that he was going to introduce it, no. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, just... I want you to see the full interview because I think Macklin was was great in it. I tried to just make it different, again, from all the standard questions and things that you knew would be asked of him uh, at the podium and other opportunities he's had down in Las Vegas. All in all, like I said, it was a really good experience at this venue. If it is really the last time the NHL is going to do an in-person draft, uh, this was a great way to go out. But I, I certainly hope they consider something like this in the future moving forward, especially if they can do their award show on one night and the draft – On the next two days, nights and days, some combination of that, Um, I don't think anybody minded, you know, Las Vegas for this event. I suppose they could also move it around, but um, I'll make a totally separate video, by the way. In fact, I'll I'll just record it as soon as I'm done with this one about behind the scenes and the experience of what that draft was like at the Sphere. I'm going to do a little Telestrator video, so make sure you check that one out when it's on here, uh, here on the channel. Uh, There was so much going on behind the scenes. It was a little bit atypical in terms of a, like, pro 
pro sports event, like a draft event or a winter meetings for baseball type event, just because of where it was held. Uh, But it was special, and I hope they consider doing it again. Good weekend for the Sharks. There's a lot to be optimistic and excited about, and I think we all need to understand patience is still part of this process, but things are happening, and they're happening sooner than later. You've made it here to the end of this video. You know I really appreciate that. Thumbs up down below. That'll greatly help me and this video and this channel, and if you've never seen me or any of this before, I'm actually glad. Glad you found me. Glad you're here. I want to make sure you come back. The best way to do that is to go down there right now, like literally right now. Hit that subscribe button so I can definitely see you back here next time.